You're watching News 25. Local coverage you can count on. News 25 is brought to you by J.K. Nelson Law. Voted best of Pahrump for four years. Give them a call, 775-727-9900. News 25 is also brought to you by Gunny's Air Conditioning and Heating. New, service, and repair. Call Gunny's, 775-727-6800. Thank you for joining us here on News 25 and East Country Radio. I'm David Preston. And I'm Roy Rossell on this Thursday, July 27th. A structure fire broke out at 1.20 this afternoon on Quail Run Road right off Benevich Street in Bell Vista. News 25 spoke to Sheriff Joe McGill for the details. Hi, today at about 1.20 this afternoon, Nye County Sheriff's Office Dispatch received a call reporting a fire to a residential structure here on Quail Run. This is in the area of Banovich and Bell Vista on the extreme west end of Pahrump. Uh, our deputies responded as well as Pahrump Valley Fire and Rescue and when units arrived the residence was found to be fully engulfed. Fire department went to work putting the fire out and did locate one individual inside the residence. That individual was removed from the residence and was later pronounced deceased at the scene. It uh, is reported that there are probably also animals inside the house, dogs or cats, uh, not a whole lot, but uh, we are still clearing the house for any animals and any potential other individuals and further information will be provided at a later date. Cause of the fire is unknown at this time. We have the state fire marshal here to investigate the cause of the fire and they will release that information. There are two sheds on the west side of the house that uh, have a little bit of uh, smoke and heat damage, but they're largely unaffected. It's the main residence that is mostly uh, affected by the fire. We received information that there should be pets in the residence. Whether those are still in the residence or not, we don't know yet. A couple was recently arrested in Las Vegas for an alleged child abuse, not only physically, but also keeping two of the children in cages. Be warned, this is a sensitive topic and viewer discretion is advised. Two Las Vegas residents were arrested earlier this week and are accused of keeping their children in cages. The couple, Travis Doss, age 31, and Amanda Stamper, age 33, are facing a total of 41 counts of child abuse, kidnapping, and attempted murder. Doss is also facing additional charges of sex trafficking. According to reports, Stamper told police that Doss coerced her into prostitution for money. And according to the declaration, officers were dispatched to a convenience store where Stamper, who is five months pregnant, was hiding from her husband because he allegedly said that he was going to kill her. Upon their arrival, she told them to go to their apartment. Once police arrived at the scene, there were seven children inside of the apartment, from ages 2 to 11 years old. Once officers got into the apartment, they found that there was a kennel with two of the children inside padlocked shut. The two children were ages 9 and 11. Police said that they needed bolt cutters to open the cage to let the children out. Court transcripts show that an emergency physician testified when the couple was in court, saying that the child had black, swollen eyes, multiple bruises and lacerations, looked to be malnourished, and had a skull fracture. Stamper allegedly says that she thought the child was dead for about five days beforehand. The physician says that the child would have died if not taken to the hospital. After being released from the cage, the child told police that he was stealing food at night which is allegedly one of the reasons that he was beat. After an interview with police, Stamper told authorities that Doss hits the children with his hands, feet, belts, extension cords, and skillets. Police say that the skillet that was found in the residence did allegedly have dents in it from the kids' heads. All of the children, when they were found, were covered in marks from the neck down. The main charges that Stamper is facing is child abuse, but Doss is facing numerous charges that also include child abuse, sex trafficking, attempted murder, and kidnapping. A vehicle caught fire in Las Vegas and reportedly extended to the home. RJ Camacho has the story. 
At approximately 6.33 on July 26, a vehicle fire was reported at 3060 Sierra Ridge Drive in Vegas. According to reports, while en route to the fire, the situation was upgraded to a medium-level structure fire due to reports of the vehicle fire expanding to the structure. Upon arrival, firefighters found a single-story family dwelling with two vehicles currently ablaze expanding to the garage. Crews managed to contain the fire to the vehicles and the garage, with negative fire extension to the living quarters of the home. A total of five engines, one ladder truck, two rescues, two investigators, and two chief officers responded to the scene, totaling a report of 32 personnel. The American Red Cross also responded to assist three adults. Currently, no injuries have been reported, and the cause is under investigation. A man from Oklahoma has been arrested in Las Vegas after he allegedly abducted his wife, planning to kill her and himself. An Oklahoma man was arrested in Las Vegas after kidnapping a woman and driving her over 1,000 miles to Las Vegas, and allegedly trying to kill her and himself after being confronted by police. Sean Smith was arrested on Monday, July 17th, and is facing charges of kidnapping and attempted murder. According to reports, both Smith and the unidentified woman were in an alleged relationship for about 10 months, living in Oklahoma. The two got into an alleged heated fight on July 14th, which led the woman to leave Smith's residence shortly after. He allegedly followed her to the gas station where he got into her car and kidnapped her while she was trying to escape. The woman later told detectives that Smith made her drive the car and if she did not listen, he would allegedly hurt her. Once the two arrived in Texas, the woman says that Smith threw both of their phones onto the side of the road. She claimed that he would not let her do anything alone, including only letting her use family restrooms at gas stations so that he could allegedly monitor her. On Sunday, July 16th, when they arrived in New Mexico, they allegedly stopped at a dollar store where the woman purchased a prepaid phone in an attempt to contact her daughter on Facebook. Smith reportedly took the phone away before she could do that. However, the woman did tell detectives that she placed a note in the store's bathroom stating that she needed help and that they were heading to Las Vegas. When they arrived in Las Vegas on Sunday night, they got a room at the Excalibur. According to the woman, the two went out on Monday and they got a marriage license and later got married. She stated that she only complied to this because she feared that if she didn't, somebody would hurt her daughter when they got home in Oklahoma. As they were on their way out of a novelty store after eating at Denny's, they were pulled over by officers near Sahara. While they were waiting for detectives to return to the car, the woman says that Smith grabbed her arm and began pressing a box cutter to her wrist, allegedly saying that he was going to kill her and then kill himself. Smith allegedly put the car in drive and fled the scene after police. They were again stopped by officers near 6th Street and St. Louis Avenue. According to officials, the woman got out of the car and rolled into the dirt where she was bleeding profusely. Smith allegedly tried cutting her wrist once again when she was on the floor, but officers allegedly surrounded him. So he began cutting his own wrist. The unidentified woman was taken into the hospital later on and received 13 stitches. When Smith was interviewed by detectives, he stated that this is really out of character for him, but he did do it. Smith was then later read his Miranda rights and asked for a lawyer. Las Vegas court records show that when Smith was in court on July 20th, he pleaded not guilty. The judge set his bail at $750,000 and he will appear back in court on August 3rd. News 25 will be back on the other side of this break. You're watching News 25, local coverage you can count on. And welcome back. In our final part for our coverage of the Nye County Sheriff's Office requiring more funding from the Board of County Commissioners, Sheriff Joe McGill talks about the growing homeless issues coming into prompt as well as the need to hire more officers for additional calls of service. The homeless situation recently has been increasing in our valley. Uh, we have seen a increase in homeless individuals around our community and living in the homeless encampments uh, behind the Nugget and the Smiths area. Much of that area up there is private property. 
Many of those property owners live out of state. The problem is, is that we have to have a property owner ask us to remove the people from their property. If we don't have a property owner or a representative of the property owner stand up and ask for the removal of those individuals, there is absolutely nothing that we can do. It is private property and we have no authority without that property owners asking us to do so. Uh, the increase in population of the homeless around the valley is noticeable in our shopping centers, in our community, and all around uh, Southern Nye County. The problem is, is that we have a total of 18,000 square miles of Nye County that we have to police. When we don't have the number of, in, of deputies available for that, when we don't have the number of detention deputies to house the prisoners, uh, it, it comes to a point of safety on our part. And if we cannot get an increase in our, in our manpower and our personnel, then we may have to cut some services. There are things that I'm already considering taking away as far as what we would respond to. I don't want to have to do that. There are a couple of identified um, halfway house type businesses in Las Vegas that are bringing people in from out of state, in from Vegas. Um, and we have found through our investigations that if those individuals don't obey the rules of that halfway house, they're simply kicked out. They have nowhere to go. At that point in time, they become homeless, they're living on the streets, they're living in the desert, and we are addressing those couple of businesses that we have identified. Um, as far as people coming from out of state or out of town on their own, it does happen, word travels. People happen to pass through, maybe their vehicle breaks down. They have nothing, they live out in a tent or in their motorhome that broke down out in the desert, or they just decide that this is a good place to stay. Um, there are many reasons why our homeless people are here, and in all honesty, the majority of them want to be homeless. They don't want to be provided a residence or a tiny home or a place to stay. They want to be left alone. That's the problem, and there are many times that there is nothing that we can do about that individual. The plea deal for Hunter Biden's ongoing case has raised some concerns from the U.S. District Court judge. R.J. Camacho reports. The plea deal for Hunter Biden's criminal case involving charges of allegedly failing to pay more than $200,000 in federal income taxes for both 2017 and 2018 and the charge of illegally possessing a firearm while being a drug user has reportedly been unraveled during a court hearing that occurred Wednesday of this week. This began when a federal judge raised concerns of the president's son possibly getting preferential treatment. The U.S. District Court Judge Mary Ellen Noreka had multiple concerns regarding the plea deal specifics and her own role in the proceedings. The plan, which included an agreement on a separate gun charge. The terms of Hunter's agreement stated that the gun case would have been wiped from his record so long as he adhered to the terms of agreement. In the event he did not hold up the terms of agreement, the felony charges would have carried 10 years in prison. The agreements made regarding the plea deal left many questions for Judge Noreka. She believed that the lawyers needed to untangle technical issues, including the judge's role in enforcing the gun agreement, before they move forward with the case. While asking the defense team to explain why she should simply accept the plea deal, Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to the tax charges. He, however, pulled back on pleading not guilty later on to move forward with the plea deal. Judge Noreka raised several concerns, the first of which regarding the agreement for the gun charge, stating that it would have created a role for her where she would determine if he violated the terms, and she argued that such a role doesn't exist for judges. She also raised concerns about the agreement for the non-prosecution clause for crimes outside of the gun charge, and continued 
continued by inquiring Hunter's Ukrainian and Chinese entities that he referred to in the agreement, asking for their name as it was not mentioned prior. Finally, she asked Hunter about the last time he used drugs or alcohol and if he was currently receiving treatment for it. Hunter answered, stating that June 1st, 2019 was the last time he was under the influence and was in an anonymous support group for his substance abuse issues. However, Hunter did not say he was currently in treatment. When we come back from this break, we'll be talking about one of our local businesses' 10-year anniversary. You're watching News 25. Local coverage you can count on. News 25 is brought to you by... Mountain West Lawyer, Injury Attorneys, 727-9500. And welcome back. Recently, Living Free held their 10th annual event discussing addiction treatment. Roy Russell reports on this story. We are here at Living Free Cafe, right next to Living Free Health and Fitness for their 10 year anniversary. Living Free Health started in 2013 and moved out into Prump in 2017. Shelley and several other county officials spoke during this event. Prump is really where we got our football. I saw a need for treatment, for sober living, and eventually saw the need for the importance of a therapeutic workplace, and you're sitting in the first one in Nine County right now. I didn't want to make this necessarily about me. I think that the importance of the message that I wanted to get across for our 10-year anniversary is something that I think all of our staff, all of our, maybe our clients, but certainly all of our staff and all of our partners in the community um, understand that addiction is a deadly problem, a very deadly problem, more so than ever before, way more so than when I had my, when I was in my act of addiction. We, we spent a lot of time up at the legislative session this past six months um, talking about the fentanyl and, and opioid epidemic that's currently going on um, in our nation and our state. And um, to, to be here today to see the greatness uh, that Shelly, I know you don't want this to be about you, but you and your staff um, have done here with Living Free um, is just absolutely phenomenal. And this is exactly um, what makes me happy uh, because I get to see that I'm up there dealing with the budgets and trying to do this and trying to do this, and you're actually getting it done. Our community does not have nearly enough substance abuse treatment. And for those people who cannot afford to pay $12,000 a month to go to a rehab facility, what are you going to do, right? You, you've got nothing. You've got, you go to the hospital, you sober up in a few hours, and then you're back out on the street, you're out buying it, right? I understand how important it is to change not just what you do and how, who you hang around with because in this kind of environment you're, work, you're, you're with people who want to see you succeed. When they go back to the friends that got them there in the first place, failure is going to happen. So this is a critical place for people who have addiction to come to be with other people who are in addiction, find their higher power and find their way to change themselves and how they look at things by being around others who support them. I'm Roy Rosell reporting for News 25. It's hard to believe that the first day of school is right around the corner, and you can bet a lot of kids are going to have a hard time waking up, especially if they didn't have a regular skip schedule over the summer. So what can parents do to help ease that transition? So it's important to start that transition early so that there's not a big uh, jump whenever you get back to going to school and there's not gonna be that whiplash where you're kind of real tired maybe for the first few weeks of school. Dr. Brian Chin is a sleep specialist for Cleveland Clinic. He says if a child's wake up time is a lot different than when school starts, that transitional period is even more important. Otherwise, the child could wind up dealing with sleep deprivation. 
making it harder for them to concentrate in class. It can also impact their energy level and performance in sports. He says the transitional period for every child is going to be different, depending on when they normally wake up. However, here are some simple tips all parents can keep in mind. Tips for transitioning include just tips that we give people for a good night's sleep. So that can include、uh, not drinking too much caffeine or any sugary drinks during the day, or、uh, not having a meal too late at night. Same goes for exercise. Try to do it during the day and not too late at night. Anything that would be stimulating that would cause you to be unable to fall asleep. If your child's sleep schedule does not improve or seem to be improving, Dr. Chen suggests contacting their pediatrician for further guidance. News 25 Weather Cam is brought to you by Lerner and Rowe Injury Attorneys Office in Perump. In a wreck, need a check? Call 702-877-1500. Well, it looks like more heat is in store, along with excessive heat warnings. John has your weather forecast coming up next. News 25 weather is brought to you by. Dairy Council of Nevada. Undeniably delicious, undeniably dairy. Enjoy what's real. Hi, good evening, Nevada. It's John Kohler from the KPVM Channel 25 Weather Studios, all up and down the Ace Country Radio Network and worldwide on the local BTV app. The app you should put on your phone and then just treasure it, you know, like in your heart. 95 degrees out there in Fernley, Fallon, Sound 98. 91 in Carson City. What year? The cool spot. Congratulations. Wrestled the honors from Tonopah, which hit 94 today. 97 out there in Goldfield. 105 in Beatty. Oh my lord. And 111 in Amargosa. Definitely a hot spot. Vegas really close behind. 109 degrees. And out in Death Valley, it's、uh, perfectly miserable. 122. But here in the paradise of Prump, well, let's take a look. It's a little. It's like miserable light. 107 degrees. 108, just a little bit earlier. Winds out of the south southwest at 10 miles per hour all day long. Didn't really help too much. Sun rose this morning at 5:46, setting this evening at 7:53. Fans of the night rejoice. We picked up four minutes of the dark stuff. Low tonight, 79 degrees, and the winds continuing out of the east southeast at 10 miles per hour as we head on into the weekend. What do we see? 108 degrees. Eh, next couple days anyway. Sunshine. Sun.、Uh, Sunday. It looks like we got some clouds moving in. Winds picking up just a mite, just you know, one or two miles per hour. Uh, come Tuesday, we're going to have some clouds, maybe even some rain, and temperatures dropping down into.、Uh, well, we haven't quite shed triple digits yet, 101, 102 degrees as we、uh, get on into the rest of the week. But、uh, it's headed in the right direction. We like that. All right, back to the desk. Here's Dave and Rory. Thank you, John. Well, that wraps up this edition of News 25. I'm David Preston, and I'm Roy Rosell, and we will see you on our next newscast. Have a great night. Bye.